Fossabel's ideas are controversial to some, but not to some sites like Sustainability Now. And this is a restatement uh, of uh, what happens as we go from wood to coal to oil to natural gas to pure hydrogen. Not everybody agrees that we're going to a pure hydrogen economy, but also Ostabel is a smart guy and he studied this for a long time. Okay, then in summary, when I went back to look at all fears, the first thing I found was that newspapers were empty, essentially. The second thing I found was that the language was uniformly and excessively frightening. And the third thing I found was that a lot of advocacy was encouraging what was happening anyway. But I learned some other things, too. One interesting feature is the tendency to reversals. A benefit becomes a hazard and then becomes a benefit again. Butter is good, then it's bad, then it's good. Saccharin is good, then it's bad, then it's okay. But this also happens for some much larger scares, like cancer power lines, which hit the media in 1989. Before 1989, there were books like this. Where is it? Here. Which, which talked of magnetic fields as necess necessary for life. Then in 1989, Paul Broder's articles in the New Yorker magazine, that very reliable source of pseudoscientific fear-mongering down through the decades, came out with currents of death. This strong position drew support. And we had a consumer's guide to the issues and how to protect ourselves from electromagnetic fields. But then a funny thing happened. About a decade later, magnetic fields were rehabilitated. You can chart, you can chart that rehabilitation here. <laughs> that was 97, healing with magnets. Energy, the scientific basis for energy medicine. Magnet therapy, it's getting kind of sexy now, as you see. <laughs> And finally, bio-electromagnetic healing, you know, so we're esoteric. Okay, and in the final kind of reversal, we have this ad here, which offers to help you to sleep on magnets because since nature is drastically depleted, this environmental supplement is incredibly important. <laughs> So we're trying to increase our exposure to magnetic fields. And so we've completed the circle from fear to selling point, from magnetic fields that are too powerful for, to health, for health to fields that are too weak for health. Of course, rather than buying these magnets, you could just stand alongside a power line. <laughs> or, or sit with your back to a TV set. <laughs> Snuggle up to a kitchen appliance. There's lots of ways to increase your exposure to healthful magnetic fields. I'm reviewing these past fears not really to make fun of them, but because I think this back and forth quality of fears that suddenly rise and subside is symptomatic of a deeper problem with modern environmental thinking, a problem that we have to fix. Meanwhile, though, the fears continue to rise and fall. Let's look at some graphs of past fears. To get a rough idea of the visibility of these fears, I did a word search on Nexus for two newspapers, the Washington Post and the New York Times. These provide very rough measures, but they'll certainly show you a trend. Here, for example, is the graph for power lines and cancer. The number of articles on this subject in those two newspapers. So as you can see, there's a peak following Broder's book, where is it here, in 89? Then it, then it drops off with some skepticism. Then there's a lot of studies being done, a lot of talk. And over time, um, there's this kind of slow decline in interest. There's a similar sort of pattern we see for the population explosion. Now, this may not be quite as clear to you, but we can run a five-year average for the New York Times, and that will show you exactly how uh, how interest is going after a, after a peak, it's really starting to decline. And if this were a graph of stock, this, this means sell the stock.
is Y2K. Now, <laughs> this is fabulous. A sudden spike, okay, the Washington Post is actually running two articles a day on Y2K. And, and it drops like a, like a dead bird. <laughs> And the reason why it, why it trails along over here is, it, is for two reasons. First of all, there's a band called Y2K. And, and second, there's a steady tr trickle of self-congratulatory articles in which people say it's wonderful that we stopped the dreaded crisis in time. But beyond any given crisis, I want to point out this pattern. The fears rise and they fall to be replaced by other fears that rise and fall. As Mark Twain said, I've seen a heap of trouble in my life, and most of it never came to pass. <laughs> I suggested that it's the pattern in itself is indicative of the problem of how we approach the environment. So let's talk for a little bit about that. Environmental disputes frequently revolve around conflicts of land use triggered by fear. The spotted owl is endangered, and that means logging in the Northwest has to stop. People are put out of work, communities suffer, and it may be in 10 or 20 or 30 years we discover that logging was not a danger to the spotted owl, or it remain, may remain contentious. My point here is that the drama surrounding such disputes, angry marches and press coverage, tree hugging and bulldozers, serves to obscure the deeper problem. We don't know how to manage the environment even when there is no conflict at all. To see why, let's take a case history of our management of the environment, Yellowstone National Park. Long recognized as a place of great natural beauty, in 1872, Ulysses Grant set aside Yellowstone as the first formal nature preserve in the world. It's more than two million acres, larger than Delaware and Rhode Island combined. John Muir was delighted when he visited in 1885, noting that under the care of the Department of the Interior, Yellowstone was protected from, quote, the blind, ruthless destruction that is going on in, in adjoining regions. Theodore Roosevelt was also pleased in 1903 when he went to Yellowstone National Park for a dedication ceremony. Here he is. This was his third visit. Roosevelt saw a thousand antelope, plentiful cougar, mountain sheep, deer, coyote, and many thousands of elk. He wrote, quote, Our people should see to it that this rich heritage is preserved for their children and their children's children forever, with its majestic be beauty all unmarred. But Yellowstone wasn't preserved. On the contrary, it was altered beyond repair in a matter of years. By 1934, the Park Service acknowledged that white-tailed deer, cougar, lynx, wolf, and possibly wolverine and fisher are gone from the Yellowstone fauna. What they didn't say was that the Park Service was solely responsible for the disappearances. Park rangers had been shooting the animals for decades, even though that was illegal ever since the Lacey Act of 1894. But the rangers thought they knew best. They thought their environmental concerns trumped any mere law. What actually happened in Yellowstone is a cascade of ego and error. But to understand it, we have to go back to the 1890s. Back then, it was believed that elk were becoming extinct. And so these animals were fed and encouraged. Over the next few years, the number of elk in the park exploded. Roosevelt had seen a few thousand animals and had noted that they were more numerous than his last visit. They were because a great deal of care was taken to see that they were fed. By 1912, there were 30,000 elk. By 1914, 1914 there were 35,000. Things were seen to be going very well. Rainbow trout had also been introduced, and though they crowded out the native cutthroats, nobody really worried. Fishing was great, and bears were increasing in numbers, and moose and bison. By 1915, Roosevelt realized that the elk had become a problem, and he urged scientific management, which meant culling. His advice was ignored. Instead, the Park Service did everything they could to increase their numbers. The results were predictable. 
First, the antelope and deer began to decline. Overgrazing changed the flora. Aspen and willows were being eaten and did not regenerate. In an effort to stem the loss of animals, the park rangers began to kill predators, which they did without public knowledge. This is a uh, man in 1927 with uh, wolf cubs. It's a very cute picture, but the reason why he has the wolf cubs is they were going into the dens and killing all the animals. He was a dead cougar, 1927 again. They eliminated the wolf and the cougar, and they were well on their way to getting rid of the coyote. Then a national scandal broke out, and studies showed that it wasn't predators that were killing the other animals. After all, it was overgrazing from too many elk. The management policy of killing predators had only made things worse. 